It was just stunning football theatre on Saturday night. Quite incredible. You couldn't have made it up at half time, certainly. But what about the fallout? How vulnerable, Liam, do you think Manchester City are right now? I, the honest answer to that question is I don't know, and that's why I'm looking forward so much to the game tomorrow evening because I think it's going to tell us a huge amount about Manchester City in terms of their, their psychological process yep. and whether they can bounce back from, from setbacks that they haven't had this season. I think vulnerable is not the word. I think what's really, really interesting, I've been waiting. I remember when Manchester City played Liverpool at the start of the season and City went on to win that game 5-0. But up until Mane sending off, Liverpool gave them the best game that they'd had up until that point. And it was because they went and pressed the ball with no fear. They went and, and played and tried to play in Manchester City's half. And I saw elements of that at Anfield where the biggest factor is, yeah, they, they score three goals in a, in a short space of time. But they took Manchester City out of their rhythm in terms of possession. They stopped Fernandinho getting on the ball and feeding De Bruyne and Silva because they were willing to go and press the ball. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how Guardiola adapts his game tomorrow night for that. I think it's obviously a massive test, psychologically, collectively. One of the things I think is tough for Manchester City, so they have to go and they've got to score at least three. If Liverpool score, they've got to score five. Now think about the way Manchester City construct goals. Almost every player gets a touch. It's like a chain of logic. So it's an interface issue. All you need is one person off their game so that they don't deliver the ball at the right time to a teammate and it breaks down. It's not like a route one approach to scoring goals where there's just two, possibly three people involved. They've all got to be on their game at the same time. They've got to do it consistently. So I agree. Yeah. It's, an ama it's an amazing team. But I think under pressure mm. and knowing going into this game that they've got to score three, that everyone has to be at the top of their game, it's a massive mm. ask. Not impossible. But, but it's, it's amazing that we, we speak about Manchester City in their possession football, but the reason they play possession football is to move their team up the pitch, to yeah. counter press, to win the ball back. And then the amount of goals I've seen them score in two or three passes when they've lost the ball and then gone and won it back. Mm. But Liverpool didn't allow them to move the ball into their half because they were willing to be on the front foot and press them in their half. And uh, the third goal for Manchester United, the free kick from Sanchez, Manchester United win that free kick because they've got confidence all of a sudden. Sanchez goes and wins the ball off Danilo high up the pitch they win a set piece and then go and score for but it. If, if anything, that the way they play and how they want to play, it's almost like Liverpool use that as a trigger, don't they? Yeah. You know, the ball yeah, goes into right. Fernandinho, yeah. that's, now we're going to go and press. Yeah. Everyone knows it, mm. everyone it, it, understands what they're doing. And I think that's the one thing that Klopp did brilliantly. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, you know, if you look at the possession, people talk about Liverpool, how are Liverpool going to approach it? I mean, the possession stats were... Huge. Man City, what, was 66% yeah. possession yeah. in mm -hmm. that game? So. That's at Anfield. I'll tell you yeah. what, what's yeah. really interesting, the history of both Klopp and Guardiola. Klopp has always had a good record playing against uh, Pep's teams. And that's because they both have a fundamental way of playing. And I think the fact that Klopp shows no fear and he's willing to go and press and win the ball high up, which this season I, I wrote about a few months ago, I was getting frustrated watching teams go to Manchester City and sit back, play five at the back, Absolutely. four in midfield, yeah. soak up pressure. In the end, the pressure tells Man City score one, two and three. The best, the best performance I've seen against Man City this year, Bristol City in the Carling Cup. Yep. No fear when I pressed them away from home. Um, Liverpool, every time they've played Burnley did it at the end. Burnley did it at the nearly got something. Got beat 4-1 in the yep. end, but for, to, for about 70 minutes, yep. really gave him a good game. Even Wolves in the, in the Carling Cup, mm -hmm. they have a true way of playing and pressing the ball, and that's what causes Manchester City problems. Right. But this point about the interface, uh, Matthew's right, that, that it is some of moving parts the way that Manchester City play, but even when they were 3-2 down, when they were conceded against Manchester United, 1-2-3, they still played their football, they were still creating chances. Is the bigger question now about how vulnerable they are at the other end? Yeah, of, of course, I mean, I, but I, I think that's always been there. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, it, the dominance in possession, yeah. You know, it's, 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 no, it's not a great kind of a, a new thing that if you have the ball, the opposition can't score. That, for me, is their biggest strength. You know, look at the possession stats in that game. They got beat 3-0, but they had 66% of possession. Liverpool, great counter-attacking team that didn't need many opportunities, will sit back and then hit you with devastating speed and power and precision. But the amount they've had the ball has allowed them to kind of, I feel hide away from that, yeah. that frailty a little bit and when yeah. it does get exposed, yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely the, there. And, when, and when they know they're up against an opponent who can capitalise on a misplaced pass, I think two of Liverpool's goals were a misplaced pass, they broke, they attacked in numbers and they scored. If you know 
that there's going to be a breakdown and you're going to get exploited. That puts even more in pressure on that interface issue. I think the danger for Klopp, I don't think it will happen. Because he's audacious, he's bold as a manager, philosophically, emotionally, he's got that in him. The danger would be to think, OK, let's protect our advantage. Let's sit back. Let's not think about counter-attacking. Let's try and contain them. That's when Manchester City get a chance to build their confidence, to build the interface, mm. to really galvanise as a group. And there's a great line in, in Alex Ferguson's book, Leading, where he says the biggest error that he found in opposition managers is they would go ahead against United and protect. They would become risk averse. They would substitute an attacking player for a defensive one. He said he loved it when that happened. Because mm. it meant you could flood the opposition half. It meant you didn't have to focus on your own defence. And that would give them a chance to go forward, score in the last 15 minutes. And I think that's one of the most um, salient it's, it's managerial weaknesses that, is yeah. this risk aversity when you're ahead. But I don't think Klopp is going to no, suffer from that. I think we confuse, when we speak about football, we confuse pressure. Pressing without the ball as attacking play. Pressing, it, Manchester City, all of Pat Guardiola's teams concede the least amount of goals because they do, they play high up the pitch and he always talks about attacking small spaces and defending big spaces. If you're defending 70 yards from your goal, you've got a much higher chance of keeping clean sheets. And I see a lot of teams now think, thinking defending deep and protecting your goal is actually a safe way to yeah, defend. Yeah. When actually sometimes, if you have yeah. a lot of numbers back in defensive positions, people actually overlap and they're not actually taking responsibility. When you're playing high up the pitch as a defender, you know, right, that's my man, that's my space that I need to deal with. And I think the fact that Liverpool have caused Man City the most problems stems from the fact that they're one of the few teams willing to take them on and press them high up the pitch. But it, it is that, that lack of fear isn't it? You know, when you, when you leave fear to one side, like, like Liverpool do... <laughs> Not easy, though, right? It isn't easy. It really isn't easy. The teams that do have a chance mm. against Man City. Back to your point of frustrated, the amount of games I watched at the Etihad where the game was over before the ball was kicked. It's almost like they'd created that air of invincibility, that first seven, eight games of the season where they won every game. Yeah. All of a sudden, people just didn't know how to, how to go about it. But look, let me ask you there. This is interesting. Fear. You say people fearful when they play against City. But after Liverpool scored a second goal, you watch the Manchester City players walking mm. back for the restart. They weren't even talking to each other. They looked completely shell-shocked. Mm. And it reminded me of a batting collapse when doubt <laughs> and fear can become contagious. You get two quick wickets and then the anatomy of the collapse is people are walking out. They look like they're going to their execution. You know, my sense there is if you want to prevent that contagion, you want to combat that fear, the pl am I right in thinking the players need to talk to each other? They need to galvanise each other. They've, yeah. got, they've got to try and create that sense of unity before the restart. My sense was that they, that third goal was almost inevitable mm. after think, the second goal. Well, especially it's now that's happened twice in four days right. as well. Yeah, definitely. That's true. The fact it's come up twice in four days. We, we've both played, and I, I remember playing Manchester United and being 4-0 down after 18 minutes, and it was a haze. It's, yeah. You're yeah, caught yeah. up in a whirlwind. Yeah. You can't right. think straight. You're clouded. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. And the whole atmosphere surrounding the game at Anfield, you know, what happened on the bus beforehand, yeah. playing into the cop in the first half. Yeah. Do you find in that situation then your decision-making is just it's completely gone? gone. You, you, I, I remember watching the game back thinking, I don't remember being in that position. Because you, the crowd are going, they, Man United, it felt like they had 20 players on the pitch running at you, trying to defend left, right and centre. You, it, it's, it's so difficult. How do you You're avoid not thinking that, clearly. How do you avoid Sometimes, I think that's the beauty of football. Is, it is unavoidable. We look at, we speak about comebacks. What happened with Barcelona and PSG last season? In, they scored three goals in five minutes, and PSG looked out on their feet. It's a, such a psychological thing, and that's why we love the game. The, the, the good teams and the good manager are, are, are able to create an environment where you can almost reset. Right. I think it's it's like you know having a computer running, too many programs running. It slows it down, doesn't it? When mm. you when your brain's got too many thoughts, things and, going on. What yeah. if? What's happening? It, it, it slows the decision. All it is is decision making, isn't yeah, it? it is Surely for City, a team like that, who are so comfortable in possession, that would just be let's just keep the ball. As soon as we concede, keep the ball for yeah, five minutes. How many times? It, but I can relate to that. You know, from my sporting background, the decision making breaks down when you feel under the cost. You're not thinking straight. The clarity begins to disappear. It's a massive issue. I think not just in sport, but in life. Um, but just a sort of a shout out to footballers. You, know, you go to Augusta and you see people coming up to the age. I've sat on the Tribune and everyone's applauding regardless of the nationality. You watch a football game and you have the camera near somebody taking a corner and the obscene gestures, what are shouted at these players and the fact that they have to try and sustain their clarity in, in that kind of a cauldron, I think that is so difficult. And I've talked to footballers after a match, won or lost, the things you have to deal with, I think it, it is difficult. I think we should have more respect 
as, as neutrals and as fans for what footballers have to deal with on the pitch, regardless of whether at Anfield or the Cop or anywhere, it can be very emotionally but, tough. But, but isn't it where those philosophy, this is where that philosophy and the foundation that you lay down as a coach or a manager mm. or a football club, that's where it kicks in. Those moments, that, that's, yeah. that for me is why all that work goes in. It's not for when you're playing well. It's for those situations to know you've got that foundation to fall back on. When everyone's blurred and mm. you're kind of shocked and you don't know what's going on, like I said, Man, I Man City still Ferguson, right? kept playing, didn't yeah. they? Mm. They still could have scored again against United, maybe one yeah. or two goals. They still stuck to that philosophy, which shows me that they've got a real strength in yeah, there. Yeah, there's a strength. That's, a, that's such a good point, because even in the game at Anfield, second half, they dominated. You know, they dominated possession. And to Liverpool's credit, they defended the spaces really well. They blocked them, they made them play outside, made Sane cross the ball. Yeah. And Alexander-Arnold was probably, for me, the best player on the pitch in that yeah. game, because he, Salah scored and Mane scored, they were outstanding. But Alexander Arnold, in terms of his defending one v one, was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So I just I think that's why Man City still have a chance in this tie. Pep openly said how delighted he was with the performance. You know, everyone's mm. thinking normally what? says that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, because they normally Doesn't win. Matter what but, I but, but you can still lose and be <laughs> delighted, can't you? Yeah. Because the foundation that he's laid and the impact that he's had on those that's, players, that's, he still yeah. saw. That's even process though they driven. Lost 3 -0. That's process driven coaching, and and that, that's <laughs> it's, it's and we concentrate on results so much it's a results based industry mm. but result comes from process and that's where the likes of Klopp and Guardiola we know how they're going to play their players know exactly what they're expected to do day, day in day out on the training ground week in week out on the pitch and it shows in their performances in the game. I also wonder whether or not the history of English football has often been too often in my opinion to spoon feed players everything is done for them by agents particularly the very successful players they're told how they're going to train how they're going to rehabilitate every aspect of their lives is orchestrated by other people and I worry that they don't develop independence of spirit independence of thought and the ability when something goes wrong on the field of play to step up without having to look over to the bench to see what the manager is saying the managers are too often like puppet masters pulling strings I think Germany is an example of a philosophy in the youth system where they try and equip their young people with that independence. So instead of playing against Iceland, going to go down and becoming completely incapable of meaningful action, they're able to step up. And I think that's something a manager can do, but I think it's deeper in the philosophy of a footballing nation as well. I think if you talk to Gareth Southgate, that is exactly what exactly. he's trying to do with exactly this. Exactly right. Yeah. Create that right. independent Dead thinking. Right. Going back to your point on contagion though, Matthew, the England cricket team might be used to that sensation of tumbling wickets, <laughs> but I'm not sure Manchester City are. Yeah, exactly. Is that a problem for them? I, I don't They're not used to losing. They're not used to being in this position. Yeah, but they, they've all lost matches before, whether it be at Man City or somewhere else. You know, they've all lost two games on the spin, I'm sure. So it's, it's, it's football, it's a loss. It's another game. In many ways, when you lose a game, you, want, you can't wait for the next one to mm. come. And the next one, their next, what, three or two games for sure, a massive game. And in a way, does it make it actually easier for Manchester City right now? Pressure Probably on. not the right word, but in, in a way, the, the pressure yeah. is off because they know the scoreline is 3-0. They know they have to go out there and score at least three goals. Exactly. You've got nothing to protect. You were talking about protecting and thinking about having to protect something. When you go out, and there's a really funny saying that I've heard from managers when we've lost a game, why do you start playing when you're 2-0 down? Why is it always easier for a team to come and play when they're 2-0 down like Manchester United did? Manchester United in the second hard, half played the most aggressive front foot football I've seen in the last 18 well, months. Why was that? Jose, because they were 2-0 down. Because yeah. they knew they had nothing. There was no point sitting back. There's no the fear. Game. And there's no fear. Was, they might as well have been beaten 6-0. They, they could have been four down at yeah. half-time. So when you lose that fear and you start thinking of what you can go and uh, gain, so you're thinking about gains rather than what you're trying to protect, your performance becomes better. And that's why I still maintain that, even though it's, it's very rarely going to happen, it's not going to, it might not happen, and the chances might be slim, Man City have a, still have a good chance of going through tomorrow. I thought that might apply with Rory McIlroy yesterday. Yeah, right. <laughs> it did, it did happen, But it did, did just speak, right? Absolutely, speed, he was on the charge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>